shouting and screaming are you okay? No. I feel his hugs, his warm embrace. I feel his welcoming words come to me, my son. Are you tired? Are you weary? Are you exhausted? Come to me and I'll give you rest. That's my father. Amen? Amen. And that's your father too. See, but now we, we know better that we're in this battle and the devil's trying to destroy us. We bear the good news of salvation. We ought to bring it out there. But if our testimony is ruined, then we become paralyzed. We become ineffective. You become a disabled, wounded warrior. You can no longer fight. And so take care of your testimony. The Bible tells us live a life that is considered blameless. Now, I'm glad the Bible didn't say sinless, but it's blameless. Meaning to say that they cannot point a finger on you and say, that person is a drunkard, that person curses a lot, that person is irresponsible, is worse as an infidel, that person is a womanizer. They cannot put their finger on you. Amen? Because they see God in you. The, the good news is that we don't have to live in fear. The good news is that we don't have to worry about, you know, our own selves, our way. And, and worry about many things about our family, you know, within only our capacity. We have God with us. He promised to be with us and never leave us. And so, because God as our Father has promised to protect us against all these powers, then you can trust Him. He, he, you know, He does this, first of all, by giving us the weapons and then telling us, I'm here to defend you, I'm with you. He didn't say, all right, here are the weapons, go wear them and go to battle. No, He said, I'm with you. Did he say that? And he said that in the context of giving us the Great Commission, right? Go into all the nations, preach the gospel, make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to observe everything that I commanded you to do. And behold, I am with you even unto the end of the ages. Even unto the end of time. So in every battle, you will need faith as your shield to stop the fiery darts and church and and. Uh, and arrows that are aimed against you by the enemy. Put on the helmet of salvation. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Mm -hmm. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Put on the shield of faith. Amen? Amen. God provided all of that. In Ephesians chapter 6. Now in Psalms chapter 35 verses 1 to 3, here's what we were told. O oh Lord, oppose those who oppose me. Declare war on those who are attacking me. Put on your armor and take up your shield. Prepare for battle and come to my aid. Lift up your spear and javelin and block the way of my enemies. Let me hear you say, I am your salvation. And again in Isaiah chapter 54. And you know this verse. Here's what he promised in verse 17. No weapon fashioned against you, forged against you, will prevail and you will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and this is their vindication from me. Who declares that? The Lord. So you can bank on it. You have His word. You have His promise. So are you feeling defeated? How are you doing as a husband? You know, you've heard this before, that the best way for you to treat love, I mean to teach love to your children, is by loving your wife. Right? You don't just say it, but you do it. And you show it to your children. Because if you, your children see that you don't respect your wife, that you don't love her, that is really a bad image. That's a bad example. And what will they learn? They become husbands themselves in the future, and what will they become? I mean, what, what kind of attitude will they carry? In them? Thank God our Father defends us, and you fathers must learn to defend your family, your children. Before I go to the next point, I remember my, my son when he was uh, first, first grade in Jersey City. He was hit by a rock here by one kid. We live in a community that's, that's not good. You know, it was not a good community, the other side of it. But uh, you know how the father feels when that happens to a child? When somebody hurts your child, what do you do? What do you call this? I mean, you, you forget that you're a Christian, maybe. Right? Oh, I, 
I remember I was a young boy, and I told you this before, I don't know if you remember, some of you weren't here. I was a young boy, and I did a lot of stupid things. And one of the most stupidest things that I ever, I use the word stupidest <laughs> thing, the most stupid things maybe as a young boy that I did, was to throw a rock on a dragonfly up on, a, on, a, on a branch, on a tree branch. What was I thinking? I mean, how do you catch a dragonfly? Catch it by the tail like that. Right? You guys know dragonflies? Yeah. Okay, all right. So, so you're with me, Tutubi, all right, in the Philippines. So I was there. I don't know. And you know what happened? There was, a, there was another boy walking by, coming to school, because he was in a school, and he got hit in the face and lost his two teeth. But that young boy had a gangster brother. Oops. Oh, no. So he was bleeding, and the young, the, the gangster brother came and was gonna attack me. And I ran the best way, the fastest way. I won the marathon that day. <laughs> Went home. The next day, my dad was like putting everything together, and I wasn't moving. I was terrified. That guy's gonna kill me. And my dad was like, "What happened? Why didn't you want to go to school?" I said, "Dad." So I confessed to him. I said, "Don't worry, son. Let's go." We went. And he fixed it. He beat him up. No. <laughs> <laughs> See, my dad can do better, right? <laughs> yeah, when we were young boys, oh my dad can do better. Dad, you know. No, he went, to the, he went to the parents and he tried to settle things. And so after that, I was able to go to school fine. But he was there. I remember that. Fathers do that. I mean, I'm, I have no doubt, you know? And the next thing that God does to, to His children, He disciplines us. This is something we don't always like. This is something we don't enjoy, right? Now, there's two kinds of discipline. One is constructive, and the other is corrective. So maybe one is constructive now, okay? The, sometimes it is in the form of constructive discipline, which He takes us through difficult circumstances to strengthen us and build our faith. He did that to Job. Job! What can you say about Job? What is there to fix in Job? Nothing. He was a perfect man. Was there any, any person in the Bible that was described as perfect? But that was God saying things about Job. That he was a perfect man that he feared God, and that he hates evil, and that he devotes himself in worship. And God said to the devil one day, have you considered my servant Job? And when you look at the entire story, you'll be confused if you don't read the last part of it. But you see, what was God's purpose? Discipline like this is meant to prepare us for the future. To make us better. He's not correcting something. He is constructing. You understand the difference? There's nothing wrong. But something is not complete. Okay, he's adding. He's building. And he's preparing us for opportunities. He's preparing us for bigger challenges. And so he allows us to go through some paths that will be so challenging and so difficult. But don't think that God is punishing you. Don't, don't think like, what did I do wrong, God? No. God is just molding you, building you up, and making you a better person. Just like Job said earlier, it's like quoted, that he believes he will come out of this whole ordeal, this whole process, like gold. But there's a second form of discipline, and I call that corrective discipline. Corrective discipline, on the other hand, is meant to alter, to make better our attitudes, our behavior. It has to be, there has to be a change of behavior. Somebody told me one day, oh, you know, because that guy's a problem with his personality. I said, you think it is personality or attitude? It is attitude, not personality. God make you as you are. There's nothing wrong. But it is attitude, right? That has to change. God sometimes allows us to experience the painful consequences of our sinful choices in order to teach us what is right. Lord God. Hebrews, as you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as His own children. Whoever heard of a child who was never disciplined? 
if God doesn't discipline you as He does all of His children, it means that you are illegitimate. And it means that you are not really His child after all. 